The only easy day was yesterday. Welcome to the only easy day was yesterday, the official Navy SEAL podcast. Naval Special Warfare is always looking for hard-charging, motivated applicants from all communities. However, specific attention is paid to existing Navy sailors wanting to convert from a career path in the big Navy to one in Naval Special Warfare. I'm Daniel Fletcher. Today I speak with the Special Operations Enlisted Community Manager, a SEAL officer, to find out more about the conversion process. First, thank you for taking the time to sit down with us. I know you're a busy person. You have an important job. You got a lot of stuff going on. Uh, I think the information that you'll be able to give us will be really valuable to people coming through the pipeline. So thank you, first and foremost. Tell us a little bit about your roles and responsibilities, kind of your, your baseline areas of, of focus. I'm a lieutenant commander in the U.S. Navy. I'm a uh, 1130 designator. That's a, a SEAL Special Warfare Officer. I'm currently the NSW Enlisted Community Manager. Uh, this is typically like a 04, 05 SEAL uh, assigned to the Bureau of Personnel. We advise the commander at NPC and staff on uh, SEAL enlisted personnel matters. Anything from policies to, uh, to planning to, uh, to trying to develop incentives to keep people in the Navy or, or join the Navy. Correct me if I'm wrong here. You're kind of a strategic piece and keeping the right numbers and types of personnel coming into the pipeline to keep mission capabilities where they need to be? Numbers is certainly a, a big part of it. We also focus on the uh, quality and kind of putting everything together, whether it's the, the recruiting mission, the training at the Naval Special Warfare Center. We don't necessarily uh, oversee that, but we're definitely influential in, in big part kind of all it. decisions. One of the main reasons why we're here is to talk about the specific selection and the draft process, just to give people an idea of some of the stuff that might be a little intangible that kind of contributes to whether they make it through or not. Maybe if you could speak to that a little bit and kind of give us a little bit of your insight of some of the things that might be a little bit overlooked in terms of what you're looking for in these candidates. We use what we call the whole person approach. So uh, we look at the candidate completely. Uh, everything that we know about the candidate, everything that's put into the package, we, we assess and no one single factor is going to disqualify that, that person. We take what we're seeing of the candidate and we compare it to what our needs are. We have certain needs with uh, year groups to uh, correct inventory shortfalls. And, and when you say inventory, sorry to cut you off, you're talking about personnel. I am, right? Okay. absolutely. So when we're, we're short on a year, whether that's not enough people made it through BUDS or the, uh, the SWIC schoolhouse, we'll look to make up those shortfalls by bringing people that are already in the Navy. Okay. Sailors. Are there any areas of the process that you think candidates might overlook as maybe being more important than they might realize in terms of this whole person approach? No, I think a lot of stuff that make people a good sailor out of the Navy is the same things we're looking for them to make good SEALs. And that's things like being a good team player, being a leader within their, uh, their organization, and sustained superior performance. And, and we use the standard Navy assessments to evaluate that. So things like their evaluation reports that they're getting from their commands and the people that are working for out in the Navy. We value what they do to make themselves a better team player at that command. So any qualifications that they can mm -hmm. earn mm -hmm. out in the, in the Navy, that all contributes to uh, the way we evaluate them. Is there a certain ratio that you see is kind of consistent in terms of people we're pulling in from the big Navy versus people off the street? No, I'd say the, uh, the success rate or attrition rate is pretty consistent whether they're coming off the, the street a street session or somebody that we've brought in that's already in the Navy. Do one or the other in particular have an advantage, you think? It seems like maybe the people coming from the Navy side might have a bit more of a paper trail that you guys could reference or weed out a little bit more. Is that the case? I wouldn't say uh, anyone has an advantage. That's going to come down to what that person has on the inside, you know, the personal commitment that they've made to complete training. That's unique for everyone. So those attrition rates are pretty consistent. Our core audience is the recruit. I would love to find out a lot of details about your individual job in terms of responsibilities and kind of day-to-day -day stuff that you do. I think it's really fascinating. From your perspective, what can a SEAL SWIC candidate do to best prepare themselves for this selection process in your mind? Number one is be a, a sailor in good standing. Excel where you're at in the fleet, in the job that's assigned you, and all the tasks that are given to you by whoever you're working for in the Navy. So that's first and foremost. We, we don't want folks who have been in trouble or problematic. We need to have trust that they're going to 
you know, be able to succeed in environments where there a lot's expected out of them. Are there areas where you feel like candidates are over-focusing on certain aspects of the process uh, or certain numbers they're trying to hit or any of that? You, you find that to be the case at all? People have maybe a, a, the wrong impression of the selection process? So another big part of, uh, you know, what we're looking for candidates is, is physical fitness. And, you know, we measure that through the PST. Mm -hmm. I think there's probably a lot of people that narrow their focus down to the PST and the numbers that they're generating in their PST score. And while that's very important, uh, like I said earlier, we, we use the whole person approach. So a strong character, a strong mindset is very valuable to a candidate. You know, I used to tell people that it was about making through buzz is about 80% mental and about 30% physical. And I know that that math doesn't necessarily add up, but it basically means it's going to take more than what you got. Right. And you got to find a place somewhere inside of you to find that extra 10% and then give it. Right. So, uh, you know, I, I'm a firm believer that that buzz is mostly mental. It's going to come down to uh, to having that mental strength and that mental discipline to get up every day and go to work and go train in, in austere conditions in a, an environment that is pretty hostile to you yeah, every yeah, single yeah. day. And you got to find that motivation to, to get up and go do that. We've talked on that basically with everyone we've spoken with about the importance of the mental aspect here. So I think it's, it's great to hear that again. I think another thing that I'll try to highlight, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that you're looking for people that are, that are leaders and also great teammates. And that's not something that's really measured in a really um, clinical sense. There's no PST for teamwork at, that I'm aware of. Is that something that's done with relations to their superior officers? Sure, so I, I think you're right in saying that's a, it's a little difficult to measure. A couple ways we measure that is through letters of recommendation from immediate supervisors. So we think uh, most of the people that we're targeting for our fleet conversion to SO and SB have less than six years of service and are E5 or below. Is there any particular reason, um, just because of their age or a lot of reasons? We target those guys because uh, we, we don't want to bring them into the community too senior. I got you. Right? Right. So we don't want uh, a guy who's kind of new to the teams and, and may have some, some Navy experience but not a lot of experience in the teams in a position where they're leading troops, leading SEALs uh, in a position where uh, you know they don't necessarily have the experience base to support that leadership role. I got gotcha. you. So is that something that you encourage actively to, to seek out letters of recommendation? Is that kind of a more organic process? You kind of wait for that to happen. It's something that's encouraged to be included in their application for, okay. fle for fleet conversion. We're looking for letters of rec from LPOs, chief petty officers, senior chief petty officers that are in that sailor's chain of command mm -hmm. that can kind of speak to what that person is doing on a daily basis for that command and where they've seen that sailor demonstrate leadership initiative, all those characteristics that we're looking for. Do you guys have a face-to-face -face or an interview process to kind of validate any of that stuff, or are you guys going off paper for most of that? An option available to the sailors is engaging with the SEAL SWIC scout team. So part of that process of putting their application together mm -hmm. involves an interview with the scout team. Yeah, that makes sense. How often are you doing this process and kind of maybe give us a little bit of an overview of what that looks like for you? Quarterly, I hold a fleet conversion panel. And we take applications from fleet sailors looking to convert from whatever rate they're in mm -hmm. or uh, status they're in if they're undesignated to uh, SO or SB, right? So uh, we have a need, uh, specific year groups, to assess sailors in those year groups into SO and SB, into the pipeline. Mm -hmm. We apply historical attrition rates to those numbers. So general rule, rule of thumb, it's about five sailors to make one seal. So this quarterly panel that occurs is the voting members are SEAL and SWIC, E7 and above, who review the packages, mm -hmm. the applications, all the documents within, brief that sailor's uh, record to the group, and then we vote on that sailor, whether or not we're going to give them a shot going to BUDS or, or SWIC. How many of you guys are sitting down to do this? Uh, it's anywhere between five and ten. Okay, and what are some of the first things that you look for that you're, you're kind of just, this person's in, in terms of kind of weeding out those application packages? So first and foremost, we're looking at what the community's need is. We advertise that need via the NPC, Naval Personnel Command website. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a spot on there, and we'll open up year groups to conversion based on our need. So if we have a year group where a lot of qualified personnel, qualified SEALs or SWIC get out of the Navy unexpectedly, we may open that year group for conversion in. Okay. That's first and foremost. We're looking at what, what do we need as a community to, right, to bring right, folks right. in. Um, Second, we're looking at, does this candidate meet all the minimum requirements? Is this, a, is this a complete package, right? So are they within age limits? Are they within time and service? 
limits, what's their current pay grade. And as long as all the, the prescribed requirements as outlined in the Milpers Man 1220, TAC 300 for SEAL, TAC 400 for SWIC are met, we consider that a, uh, a valid application. Right? So, you're, so that, you're pushing people aside that, that, that are just outright, there's not able to be there for rules. Right. If you can't follow instructions and you can't go down a checklist and put an application together. Hey, you're out. <laughs> right. Yeah. I don't right. want you checking my parachute. I don't want you checking yeah, my dive right. rig. Yeah, of you you got to figure it out. Right. So uh, that's kind of step one. Don't let your career counselor do it for you. If they want to help, absolutely. You know, that's, a, that's an asset to, to right. tap into. Right. But it's your responsibility, as I said. It's your application. It's your package. Right. It's pretty so, foundational. Yeah. Absolutely. So that's kind of step one. And th those are the ones that go to the panel mm -hmm. to, to be looked at. And then, you know, it's a competitive process and we want the, the, the best and the brightest that the Navy has to offer. So it's not a free for all. We don't take everybody within our need. And we start to look for red flags and then we look for the uh, quality of the candidate, right? So we're looking at the PST score, not only the raw numbers of that PST, but we're looking at how that PST compares to all the candidates we've selected in the last 12 months. And that's, that's in terms of trying to make sure you have a balanced force. Can you explain why you're looking at the, those numbers compared to the stuff that's kind of historically recent? We look back the last four quarterly panels, and we look at all the candidates we selected, and we create essentially a distribution, right. a bell curve distribution, and we look at where this new applicant falls as far as standard deviations above or standard deviations below the mean PST okay, score. Right. Now, if you're below... We all know a lower PST score is better. Uh, so if you're below, that means you're a pretty good athlete, right? Mm -hmm. You're running mm -hmm. faster, swimming right, faster, right. Uh, stronger. If you're way above, you're, you're going to be a little bit weaker in that pack. We know that the weaker you are physically, the more challenging it is for you to complete the course at butts. So if you have a high PST, meaning a bad PST score, your likelihood of success is, is probably lower than somebody that has it. And you want people to make it through the process. Correct. This isn't just Correct. for fun. Yeah. Right, right. When you talked briefly about uh, kind of red flags, can you maybe give us some examples of those? Dealing with the fleet sailors, we have a lot of folks who have been to BUDS before mm. or been to training before. So we ask that if you have been to BUDS before and you are now looking for a second chance at BUDS, that you have served your minimum 24 months in the fleet. You mean after your first BUDS excursion, right? Right, right. So okay. regardless of, of why you stopped training, whether it was your own choice, a, a drop-on request or, or right. an injury, you removed from training, you go out into the fleet for a minimum of 24 months. We get a lot of folks that apply at the six-month mark, 12-month mark, mm -hmm. looking to come right back. That's not really our, our yeah. deal that we're offering. We can't say we made a good evaluation on your ability to correct whatever yeah. deficiency you had, whether you were immature, whether you were uh, not physically fit enough, or just didn't have the mental game. Two years is, is the period of time that we're looking to make that assessment. We're also requiring those students or those, those applicants to write a personal statement saying why they did not complete training the first time. This is pretty important. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we want to hear in your words why they didn't complete training. We're not looking for, you know, a novel. We're not looking for right. a chapter book on that. Uh, we're just looking for one page, concise to the point, but also pretty descriptive of mm -hmm. why, you, why you didn't complete training the first time that and, makes and, and why you need a second shot. Right. So that's, uh, that's one of those red flags we're looking for. And anybody out there that's not an author or an English major, we're not grading your punctuation. We're not grading your grammar. We, we want to hear. We are looking for content, absolutely. Another thing we're looking at is the evaluations that the sailor has. Mm -hmm. So whether they have never been to BUDS before or had been to BUDS before, uh, we're looking at the evaluations and we're looking at how well they've done. Uh, we're looking for people to break out amongst their peer groups on a ship. So the way the Navy evaluation system works is, mm -hmm. you know, there's EPs, early promote, MP must promote. So when you say breakout, you mean kind of uh, people that are accelerated in, in their promotion process? Or maybe you can Not necessarily that promotion, more. but doing well, okay. uh, doing everything that they're asked and exceeding those expectations wherever they are out in the fleet. So if they're working on a ship and they're a group of 30 other E4s on the ship, you know, we want to see someone in the top seven of those 30. Not necessarily a, uh, you know, disqualifying thing, right. right? So if you're not an EP sailor, if you're an MP sailor, uh, we'll, we'll still uh, take a look at you because we're looking at the whole person approach and there's no one thing that's going to disqualify anyone. But uh, that certainly would help. My impression is that you follow the steps. There's not much you can do to change 
who you are at a core. You're looking for a specific type of person that's capable, not necessarily someone who's able to check these boxes. Certainly. We look at letters of recommendation pretty equally, no matter who they're from, whether it's a uh, commander of a ship or a, the, the senior chief in a division on a ship or a troop chief from a SEAL team or a, uh, a CO from a SEAL team. Right. We weight those equally. That makes a lot of sense. So we have people that are applying to this process that are not rated and they have a rating. Can you talk a little bit more about that? We briefly touched that earlier. There's probably some misconception from guys who do not pass at one of the training pipelines we have the first time mm -hmm. and they go into the fleet by picking one rate over another or maybe remaining undesignated, they're going to have an opportunity to return to training or a better opportunity. faster than someone else, right? So to dispel some of those myths, 24 months is the minimum period of time that, that you need to spend in the fleet. You're not getting around that. The second part of that is, is we want you to become valuable to the Navy in that 24 months. Whatever you see the best way for you to contribute to the Navy, we want to see you maximize that. For some people that may be being undesignated and, and contributing to the, the Navy effort in that, in that sense, and other people it might be going out and finding a rate and completing an A school and contributing in a more qualified or, or technical sense. But whatever's right for the individual is going to work. Uh, our goal is to really look at what have you done in the two years that, that you were in the Navy before you reapplied. And how you've and, done it, yeah. And how yeah. you've done it and how, how successful you've been at it. Because really getting a rate is not for everyone. Right. Um, being undesignated is not for everyone. Everyone's got their own unique skills and attributes. Mm -hmm. And we really want to see you maximize that for the Navy. We want to see yeah. you maximize those skills you have and become valuable for the Navy. And, and then we're going to assess that and say, hey, this guy's a team player. This guy is making the most of the assets he has. And, and we like that. I think that definitely rings as a smarter choice than trying to predict what would be a more successful choice for them. You have a lot of responsibility, a lot falls on your shoulders in terms of making the right choices. What's the most difficult part of your job? A big part of what we do in community management is planning for the future. Uh, planning for growth, planning for unexpected losses, planning for how individuals will interpret our policies or incentives. This is challenging uh, because there are so many moving parts. We build accession plans based on factors such as current requirements, what we have on hand as far as SEAL and SWIP qualified personnel, and historical success rates. All these numbers change independent of each other and sometimes in, di in difficult to predict patterns. The human factor can sometimes be unpredictable. Yeah, exactly. Trying to predict the future and see where things are going to go. It's a unique challenge. Yeah. All these different variables kind of contribute to what we set as a session and production targets. And honestly, there's there's a lot of numbers that go behind it, but there's a lot of uh, variables that are, are hard to account for. And trying to predict how many guys are going to graduate each year, it can be pretty problematic. Yeah, right. I think that, that's a good, really good point to ring home. What kind of advice can you give to someone who's putting an application for this process? Sure. So uh, I'd say if you're thinking about applying for a special warfare, special program like SO or SB, the best thing you can do is put a complete package together with your best foot forward and get it submitted. So there's, there's some misconceptions out there that there, there's a lot of people that can stand in your way from putting an application in. I think that's incorrect. What if, do you mean by stand in your way? Sure. If you're not getting a lot of support from your command, that you're at, certainly they can voice that opinion, but they can't prevent you from applying for one of these programs. That goes the same for the community managers that I work with at Bupers. All the communities have a need, right? A need to fill sailors into jobs. Our need is, is pretty strong in the Navy's opinion. And there's very few cases where another community's need uh, outweighs our need. It does happen sometimes, and, and it's always on a case-by-case -case basis. So Best thing you can do is, as a sailor, put your, your application together, uh, make it the strongest application you can possibly make, whether that's your letters of recommendation, your PST score, you know, your evaluations, the qualifications you're earning on the ship, and, and make sure it's submitted. It will get to us. We will look at it. Based on our need and that sailor's qualification, we'll make our selections, and then uh, we'll go to bat for you if we really want you. So, so put your best foot forward. Get your application in, and, and we'll take care of it with community managers and, and commands if we need to. Well, I think you've dropped a lot of wisdom on us. It's been super helpful to talk to you. I think your words will go a lot of way to help people kind of make this transition and hopefully get more successful people through the buzz process. Thank you so much for your time. You got it. Find out more at sealswick.com and join us again for the next NSW podcast. Head's off, eyes open.